welcome everyone to this special program where we bring to you the neuroscience of meditation. We also hope you take back with you an experience of meditation with our guided activity and some knowledge and resources that will help you advance your journey in meditation if you do choose to. Now, at the outset, it is fair to say that there is no scientific study more vital to man than the study of his own brain. And all human beings share basic anatomical circuits and synaptic interactions, but the precise pattern of connections and the interactions are highly variable from person to person. And therein, you know, lies the source of the remarkable variation we see in human behaviors and capabilities from, you know, maybe the breathtaking dance of a ballerina to the elegant craftsmanship of a carpenter to the shrewd judgment of a trader to a criminal mindset, everything is coded in the brain. And our brain makes us who we are, enabling us to perceive beauty, to react, to learn, and even ideation or imagination of a different future. And tremendous advances in neuroscience science have occurred in the past two decades with the 2010s being called the decade of the brain and there has been a revolution in the field of neuroscience with the discovery that the brain is not completely hardwired and fixed even in adulthood it is constantly changing throughout a person's life and is remodeling its circuitry with each new experience and everything that we do changes the brain in some way when we practice a skill the brain regions we use for that practice grow bigger and when we do not use parts of our brain those regions might shrink and this is what scientists call neuroplasticity now all this adds up to the tantalizing question of today how does meditation change the brain and for thousands of years there was no way of testing scientifically whether meditation would work it was purely internally experienced discovered and verified by each practitioner within their own mind and space but fortunately, in the last few decades, new technologies have allowed us to objectively measure some of the effects of meditation, and the findings are fascinating. And in our program today, we intend to share with you such findings. Researchers led by Professor Sergio Elias Hernandez from the University of La Laguna in Spain, in collaboration with scientists from different universities, have been exploring for more than 10 years the benefits of the state of mental silence or meditation for a human brain. Professor Sergio, with his wealth of knowledge and experience that ranges from astrophysics to biomedical instrumentation through development of prototypes for medicine to the neuroscientific study of meditation is our esteemed guest today. He has 20 international scientific articles published, several R&D and innovation projects and some patents to his credit. So let's go ahead and welcome him on the program. Welcome Sergio. So thank you very much for for welcoming, for having me with you. It is for me a great job. And also I want to congratulate you for your beautiful programs. I have already seen some of your videos and they are really great. They are very interesting. Well, thank you so much for that kind of appreciation, Sergio. But we are very excited to talk to you and learn from you. And Sergio, it is said that the most complex system in the universe is a human brain because it has about 100 billion neurons, which is, you know, more than all the stars in the galaxy. And they're constantly communicating with each other. So studying human brain is imaginably very challenging. So tell us, first of all, about how all of this research got started. So first, I should mention that I, I, I did start practicing meditation when I was a student at the, in Madrid, at the Polytechnical University of Madrid. And have, I haven't always had this desire to, to know about myself, about the spirit, about the, this world, about the, the aim of our lives. So I've started um, in 87, I, I, I had the opportunity to, to have a a very precious experience about meditation and mental silence that really allowed me to see a part of myself that was very important, my, to, to, to see my subtle body and my, my spiritual body. And since then I've been practicing meditation. And after I finished my PhD related uh, between neuroscience uh, um, and instrumentation, uh, I, uh, I really have this desire to, to, to do research about meditation and neuroscience. 
So at that at the very beginning, I had the, the, this desire, and I asked my uh, the people from university, my the tutor of my PhD, could we do some research, some research about neuroscience and meditation? And at the very beginning, they, they didn't were very much enthusiastic about the, the idea. But after a while, a few years later, in 2010, they they came back to me and they say, I think I think we have all the possibilities now to start doing this research in meditation and neuroscience. So I was very happy. And since 2010, we have been doing our best to, to explore our brain in meditation, in mental science from different angles or perspectives. Wonderful. It's it's really amazing, you know, how things have just turned a corner and, you know, there's so much interest, so much uh, curiosity around these kind of studies now. Well, so, Sergio, what I wanted to talk to you about first was that unlike, you know, other animals, human beings spend a lot of time, you know, thinking about what is not going on around them. We are contemplating events that might have happened in the past, might happen in the future, or perhaps may never happen at all. And indeed, you know, stimulus, independent thought or mind wandering appears to be the brain's default mode of operation. And although, you know, this ability is a remarkable evolutionary achievement, cognitive achievement that allows us to, you know, learn, reason and plan, it may have an associated cost. And many philosophical and religious traditions teach us that happiness is to be found by living in the moment. And practitioners are trained to resist mind wandering and to be here now. Now, these traditions have all along suggested that a wandering mind is an unhappy mind. But the question is now, were they right all along? Because a 2010 scientific study by Harvard psychologist has gone ahead and said just that. Well, uh, what you say is very true. And this is this research that was published, uh, you just mentioned in 2010, it was very unique, very, uh, and somehow it, it marked a, a, a very special um, event in, in neuroscience. Because you know, on this research, it was very simple and clever at the same time. They, uh, they had uh, around 5,000 volunteers from more than 80, I think 83 different countries. And they were asking them, uh, how do you feel? Where is your attention? What are you doing? Different questions. And, and what they saw was very clear. Those volunteers having their attention in the here and now uh, were those who were happier. And those with their attention uh, somewhere in the future, in the past, they were unhappier. Um, the conclusion was clear. So we have our mind that has this capacity about thinking. Uh, uh, that allow us to go to the to imagine the future or, or to remember the past that is very normal but uh, also if if you go too much to the future or you go too much to the past you are losing the present moment and i always try to remember myself that the present is synonymous of uh, a gift something that is very precious so today for neuroscience not only this article but many other uh, different articles say that it's very clear that the best state for our mind for our body physical and mental health is to be here and now and to enjoy life because whenever we are in the past or whenever we are in the future thinking about the past or thinking about the future we are losing the present moment and what is life life is in the present whatever was the past is gone it's not there and whatever is in the future we don't know but it's also not the reality the reality is the here and now, and this is our capacity. So it, it, this is very clear today, but we have a tremendous um, tendency to be thinking and thinking and thinking. It's very difficult to reach this state of mental science. That is so true. That is so well uh, said, Sergio. I think perhaps that's the hardest thing for us human beings to do is to be in the present. And the only thing to lose is that, you know, uh, you just lose the present and there is a cost to not being in the present. Definitely, like we said, you know, it is a cognitive achievement, but it has a cost. And I think those scientists also said that whatever activity we are doing had only a modest impact on whether the mind wanders or not. And it almost has no impact on the pleasantness of the topic that the mind wanders to. And interestingly, they said, you know, what people are thinking was a better indicator of their happiness than what they're doing so that attention definitely you know needs to be watched where it's going 
Well, yeah, thank you so much for, you know, elaborating that study and the findings. But Sergio, you yourself have done several studies over these past years, and let's talk about each of them. So let's start by talking about the study that you did in 2015, where you monitored the neural activity during the state of mental silence as achieved with the practice of Sahaja Yoga meditation. So tell us about what the control group was doing and what were the findings of this study? Yes, this was our first uh, research. We had uh, one of the main um, advantages with that we have is that we had access to a magnetoresonance scanner. As, as you already said at the beginning, a magnetoresonance scanner is a very uh, complex instrument um, very sophisticated, and we, with this instrument, we have the capacity to measure, to monitor the neuronal activity on our brain. So, in when we started, this is, was our first project, is just to see what was the neuronal activity when the people reached this state of mental silence. I should say that because this to reach this state of mental silence is quite difficult, there is the possibility, this uh, specific uh, meditation called Sahaya Yoga, one of the great uh, benefits of this meditation it is quite it's quite it simplifies a lot the this uh, possibility to reach mental silence so um so so for this study we had uh, 19 volunteers and we asked them to meditate inside the magnetoresonance scanner and they did three consecutive meditation uh, we, we ask them, just yes, please try your best to, to reach this state of mental silence. And what we saw is that at the beginning, they were very short meditation, two minutes each. And at the beginning, there were uh, a neuronal activity on frontal lobes and temporal lobes. That, uh, and this activity was interpreted by us like uh, this uh, effort to silence the mind. Because our mind, if you if you do not um, put an effort, it's, it's wandering all the time. No? We have a wandering mind, as by default. So on the third meditation, we saw this uh, neural activity on the frontal lobe and temporal lobe, which associated with the effort to silence our mind. On the second meditation, this activity diminished a lot. And on the third meditation, there was a, um, a very specific area that is called the insula on the right hemisphere. Uh, that was activated. And this is a very uh, particular area. On this particular area, it takes uh, the function there is related what, with the uh, interoception. Interoception is our capacity to have to monitor how, how we are inside. And this is very, very crucial for our harmony because sometimes when we are here in the mind wandering, our mind is on one side and our body is on the other side. And somehow they are disconnected the one from the from the other and when you are monitoring yourself uh, uh, with this uh, the activity on this insula you can feel yourself and uh, and allow you to be in the here and now and this insula has been also uh, uh, mentioned in other types of research related with meditation and for us was a, a, a clear signal that those meditators and even those meditators who, who said that they are more, more time in mental silence have a, a, even a greater activity on this area. So there was a close relation between this state and here and now in mental silence and activity on this area, the insula. Mm -hmm. This is what we, we the main uh, the main result that was published, on, as you already said, on this uh, 2015 article. Mm -hmm. All right. So your control, what were they doing? No, this, on this research, we only had uh, meditators. Okay. We have 18 meditators and they have as a control, what they have uh, at the very beginning, they have as a, it was to, to monitor different states. And we compare the state of, men, of mental silence with the state of having their attention on breathing without meditation. But uh, on, the very, on this very uh, first study, we didn't have a control group as such. Got it. Okay, got it. Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. But in the abstract, I think it was mentioned that the state of mental silence as experienced in Sahaja Yoga meditation, so far as your study was done, was only investigated through the use of EEG. And your study was able to do it with a better resolved technique of functional uh, you know, MRI to more thoroughly investigate the precise neurofunctional correlates of this state. So did you want to like elaborate anything to that intent? 
Well, the, those previous studies on with uh, electroencephalography or EEG mm, were very important also. They also mentioned the, how the activity uh, somehow this, there are different types of, of technologies and they, they complement each other. Through EEG, you have the possibility or the capacity to measure with precision in time, around uh, milliseconds, but you don't have the precision in space. Because on EEG, you just put electrodes on, your, on the surface, on your scalp, but uh, it's very it's inaccurate to say where is the activity is here or there. It's mainly when the activity is on an area like the insula that is a few centimeters inside our brain. So with the magnetoresonance scanner, uh, neuronal activity or fMRI, we uh, don't have this resolution in time. We have a resolution of seconds, but we can have a precision in a space around uh, uh, millimeters. So we have in EG a precision in, in time, but with fMRI, we have the precision in space that allow us to see which part of the brain is related with this state of, of mental silence. Awesome, awesome. That's that's really very helpful to know. Thanks for sharing that with us. So, Sergio, um, you know, there is growing awareness that distribution of gray matter volume in our brain has an important role on our mental health, our behavior, our cognitive functions. And in your next study that you did in 2016, you were able to conclude how the anatomy of the brain is positively altered with long term seizure meditation. But the before you share your findings on that, tell us a little bit more about gray matter as it relates to us human beings practically, and also tell us about voxel-based morphometry, which according to your abstract is a new approach of looking at structural brain changes. Well, um, yes, answering your first question, we should know that uh, our brain has three different types of matter. The gray matter, that is mainly the nucleus of the neurons and the connections or synapses between neurons. The gray matter, uh, then we have the white matter that have the long connections or atoms. And we have also the cerebrospinal fluid that is a liquid that is in the holes of the brain. The gray matter is quite important because uh, when you were talking at the beginning about uh, neuro neuroplasticity, neuroplasticity is the best way to measure it because we are doing new connections every moment. Our brain today is different, a little bit different from our brain tomorrow because there are a new connection, the new experiences, new things that we have learned. And depending on though the areas that you uh, use more, those areas get larger gray matter because it creates new connections with the neurons. The gray matter is quite important because uh, it somehow allow you to, to, to function as a human being and to, de to develop your different uh, capacities. Also, it's important to know that when you when we get when we age, when we get older, we are losing gray matter. When we are around 20 years of age, half of our brain, 50%, is gray matter. But when we are around 60 to 70 years of age, our gray matter diminishes to 40%. This is normal with aging, but um, as we get older, our capacity is to learn new things, to, to, to open to new experiences is a little bit less than when we are much younger. Also important is to say that there are important diseases like schizophrenia or depression or anxiety or even stress that are correlated with a loss of gray matter. So to, to, to keep your gray matter intact is very important for your mental health. Mm -hmm. okay. And the second topic, the voxel um, morphometry, uh, voxel-based morphometry is a type of research in which uh, you can, uh, when you acquire the images of the brain with a magnetoresonance scanner, you have the capacity to somehow locate, to, first of all, you have to differentiate what is gray matter, what is white matter, and what is cerebrospinal fluid. Mm -hmm. There is uh, uh, some uh, programs with a mathematical, mathematical analysis. So it's a semi-automatic uh, uh, methodology that allow you to measure the gray matter and to uh, compare gray matter from two different groups, like we, we, we did. We, we compared the, uh, the gray matter of volunteers practicing Sahaja Yoga meditation for more than five years, and another group, both group with 10, 23 volunteers, uh, similar age, similar education, uh, the same number of men and women, 
and everything was similar with the, with the exception that in one group they were meditating daily for more than five years and in the other group they didn't have experience on meditation and with this voxel based morphometry is a very is the most used technology to measure differences in gray matter volume all right and i think you observed overall with meditators there was an increase in the gray matter overall right for this study yes we, we saw that, that there were a type of study has been done with many different uh, populations from the taxi drivers from people learning to travel to keep the balls in the air from with musicians and we what we have seen we have uh, learned a lot about our brain and we have seen what we already said that those parts of the brain that we use more get larger gray matter volume and also in meditation we saw in the other types of meditation we saw or they saw they published that uh, those part related with the attention and the, the control of emotion got, got to like the gray matter but in all these studies the gray matter difference was located in a very precise uh, area very small uh, like a few millimeters of uh, cubic of uh, volume but what we saw it that was that the difference was in the whole brain and this is the the only study as far as i have seen is the only study that i have published a, a difference in gray matter volume in the whole brain and this seven percent that we saw the difference between meditators and non meditators is the largest ever published difference in gray matter volume is something unique for this some people say no seven percent looks is not so so big you have to keep in mind uh, uh, such a severe uh, sickness like schizophrenia is correlated with a difference of gray matter around two or three percent. Another many important uh, mental diseases are correlated with a one, two or three percent uh, when you compare a, a healthy group and a, a, a group with these severe diseases. So uh, we compare two groups of both, all volunteers were healthy they have to pass a kind of a filter or examination and both of them were uh, held healthy and this is the biggest uh, difference in gray matter volume so we are very very um, enthusiastic about the research okay. and this research has also some implication in the sense that it was one of the most uh, readed article and a few just last month at the end of July, the journal that one which was published plus one say to us that it was one of the most uh, cited uh, scientific article that year. So yeah, we were very happy. I was so glad when you shared that email with me and it's so wonderful to see that you know this is the most downloaded article or study so far. And also, you know, very encouraging is the fact that the percentage increase in the gray matter volume that you've reported with Sergio Yoga Meditators is the largest ever that has been reported in the scientific journal. So this is really great information over there. But I think another point in this study that I wanted to discuss with you was the tendency line graph that you did. And you concluded with uh, the use of that graph that the gray matter volume diminished very slowly in Sahaja Yoga Meditators than uh you know the non-meditators so is that correct yeah that is correct right. so we, we 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 saw that the meditator not only have a larger gray matter volume but when you when you see the tendency where in a figure where you depict the, the gray matter volume percentage where with age you see that as i already said uh, around 20 you have 20 years of age you have half of the brain around 50 percent if we matter in both groups we are the same but when you when we are in the, um, the 60 or 65 years of age uh, the tendency line for non meditator was around as i already said around 40 percent of gray matter at six, uh, 65 years of age but meditator instead of 40 they have around 44 percent and this is uh, quite a big difference and this uh, is an indicator that also what we have seen that the, the meditator has uh, this benefit on the gray matter and the brain is younger and healthier and more capable for doing and learning new things 
Right. Isn't that awesome? Not only does the gray matter increase to a very significant degree, it also diminishes very slowly. That's a really interesting and very valuable study, I must say, Sergio. And I do mm -hmm. want to congratulate you on that. But from what I understand uh, further, that in the study that you did in 2020 was an extension of your earlier study, this one where you just concluded that, you know, 7% increase in gray matter. But in 2020, you analyzed in more detail how the gray matter differences are distributed across whole brain. So tell us your observations and conclusions of this research and how does it translate for us in our everyday lives? Well, when we published our first uh, study in 2016, we did a, we used the standard statistic. Down. This standard statistic is just to compare uh, um, the whole brain and it's like compared to mountains and the peaks of two mountains and but and somehow it's the assumption there that the, the whole volume of gray matter is similar because in our case it was it was not the case it was uh, there was a difference of around certain of gray matter volume we had to somehow to introduce a new uh, methodology for the statistic so we we asked one of our professor in my university who was an expert, who is an expert on statistics, to help us to compare area by areas the how was uh, in which area this difference was more pronounced or larger, and we saw that in all areas, in almost we had we did two divisions of the brain, one in large areas like we call it the lobes, the frontal, uh, temporal, occipital. And also we did a comparison with small areas to divide the brain in 116 areas. We saw that in all areas, meditated to have larger gray matter, but in very important areas, this difference, this larger gray matter was statistically significant. When I say statistically significant means that it was not by chance. It was uh, very clear that there was something different in one group respect uh, to the other. And what we published in 2020 was that those, uh, the both frontal lobes on the right and left hemisphere and the right temporal lobe or, <clears throat> and other areas, but these were the, more, the main areas, in those areas, uh, meditators have larger gray matter volume, statistically significant. And these areas, like the both tem uh, frontal and the right uh, temporal lobe, are very important because somehow they define our personality, they define our capacities to react, they define our capacity to take our decisions. And so they, they, they shape, in a way, our personality. And if you have a larger gray matter there, it's, uh, it's very important. Also, you have to, to think that when you are, the frontal lobe is the part of the brain that um, that it, it takes large, uh, for example, in adolescence, they are still, they are growing the gray matter there. So when you reach adulthood, your frontal lobes are really uh, in the normal shape. And for example, for an adolescent, it's very complex sometimes to control their emotions, to control their, their feelings, because those parts of the brain are not fully developed. But if you have larger gray matter volume there, it means that your capacities to control your emotions and to control your attention is uh, larger or is much better than a, a non-meditator. Mm -hmm. So this is what the main results that we publish on that. Yeah. And I think that being said, it then makes all the more sense for adolescents to start practicing meditation, you know, at that age, like mm -hmm. you mentioned, it's harder for them to, you know, get through their emotions. So yeah, I wish, uh, you know, more of us could utilize that knowledge. But then, uh, Sergio, there were two more studies um, that you did, one in 2018 and another just last year, which actually observed the strengthening of attention and weakening of mind wandering. But tell us more about those two studies. Uh, this was the other type of, um, let's say, of methodology or technology related with the uh, images from the metro resonance scanner. There is a technology that is called functional activity. Today, uh, we know that different parts of the brain, although they could be apart from each other, they could be cooperating in order to enhance uh, complex functions. What we study on, on, on that research is was the functional connectivity 
on this state of mental silence and also on this on the state of resting and on resting state on resting state normally you have a, your mind is wandering for example if you are waiting if uh, yes for the doctor or you are waiting in, in a queue or whatever normally your mind is wondering tomorrow i will do this or yesterday this happened or that so what we saw is in resting state meditators were not with their mind wandering they were more in the here and now which is much better for our uh, mental and physical health and in mental uh, silence we saw that there was a um, a very particular specific area that is called anterior solita, just a few centimeters behind our the central of our forehead. And that on that area, meditators, those meditators having a better meditation inside the magnetic resonance scanner, and also having uh, frequently reaching this state of mental silence on their daily meditation, they have larger gray matter volume there, and they also have larger the group of meditators have larger gray matter there than the non-meditators and those that area the anterior cingulate was cooperating with the insula on both hemisphere and the putamen and the insula as i already said is related with interoception and the putamen is related with the state of of joy of uh, somehow happiness but the happiness that is not is just very peaceful and this somehow give us a, a definition of this state of mental silence. Mental silence, you are here and now, you, you stop your mind wandering, but you are with your full capacities and you are also in a state of peace and joy. You just enjoy living. And this, this was very, um, we were very happy that we could uh, see this on our research on this uh, functional connectivity that we published in, as you already say, in 2018 and this year 2021. Mm -hmm. Awesome, that, that's really some great studies over there. So Sergio, I know you have also spoken about the linkage of music and the brain in uh, another interview of yours, but would you share with our listeners here any information around that? Well, music, um, we should know that our brain has two different hemispheres and these two hemispheres are connected mm, with a kind of highway of uh, white matter. And uh, this is a corpus callosum. And these two brains, in a way, they have two different uh, behaviors. No? We, the left brain is more for the rationality, even for science, uh, to focus, for to plans. And this is the left brain. And the right hemisphere, or the right brain, is more related with art, with emotions, um, also with music. And also there is another part, a very important part of the brain that is a little bit uh, more inside, that is the limbic area, that is more related with this, also this state of mental silence. It is said that it's the, the last center of uh, energy or the score or chakra. And this uh, right hemisphere has more connections with this limbic area and uh, through music uh, uh, you can uh, reach uh, somehow it facilitates your capacity to reach this state of mental silence to reach the joy and also music is very much related with emotions and uh, in, in yoga and in, in indian classical music you have a very specific uh, type of uh, music that is, uh, probably you know better than me that are the ragas and with ragas, you can somehow touch every uh, aspect of this subtle spiritual body and to enhance all these wonderful qualities that we as human beings have, that we can reach also through meditation. This is such valuable information. And I really want to thank you, Sergio, for all of uh, you know this dedication that you've had for conducting these studies for the last 10 years. And I would say this is a very, very valuable contribution that you've made to the societies. I do want to thank the founder of this meditation. You know, this is an invaluable gift to the humanity, honestly. But I do want to thank you for taking the time today and coming to us and, you know, speaking to us about all your findings in such detail and giving us your time. Thank you so much, Sergio. So thank you very much. I, I also would like to, if you allow me, just want to sure. say that I was not alone in this research. I had the possibility to to collaborate as you already said at the beginning but i want to say that we are uh, 
research, doing research on a group. And for me, it's a, a great, um, let's say, a great pleasure and a great uh, honor to be cooperating with researchers from different universities around the, the globe. And they really help me a lot. And so it's not my, it's not only my doing this. Uh, we are around six, uh, it, it depends on, on the article, but normally we are five, six or seven researchers doing this, uh, this research or these studies. And they, uh, they do as much as I do. So it's not only me. <laughs> Yeah, that's true. And nothing can be achieved alone. So yeah. do understand there's a whole team of you working towards that. And I do want to extend my thanks to all of them as well, uh, who've contributed to this research. But once again, thank you, Sergey. It was really wonderful talking to you today. Thank you. Thank you. It was wonderful for me to be with you today. Hi, everyone. We hope you enjoyed. Thank you, Monica and Dr. Hernandez for sharing this innovative research with us. It truly is fascinating to see what can be studied through meditation and the power of neuroscience. So I'd like to invite Dr. Sergio to rejoin us because we have a few comments and questions that have come through. So hi, Dr. Hernandez. <laughs> nice to have you again uh, with us. Hi, Julia. It's a pleasure to be here. Uh, with all of you again, and thank you very much for inviting me to be here. We can't thank you enough for being here. So it's really the pleasure is all ours. <laughs> so I'm gonna just grab my phone to see what questions have come in. Um, mm -hmm. If anyone does have a question, please feel free to write it down in the comments and we'll try to get to as many as possible. So first question, Dr. Hernandez, mm -hmm. what advice do you have to people who are interested in meditation, but might feel like they can't do it or they wouldn't know how to stop thinking? Well, I should say that we are all in the same situation. We are thinking, thinking, thinking. Some One day you start watching your mind and you start watching and see, oh, my mind is thinking and thinking and doesn't stop. And, and then you start thinking, it's, it's, it's my case unique. I am the only one thinking and thinking and the other can't stop. And it's not a unique case. We are all in the same situation. We are thinking and thinking. It is said that we are, we have around fifty to sixty thousand thoughts per day. That is a lot of thoughts. Wow! And we are in this situation. So the the thing is not what the, the important thing is not what we are thinking about this. The important thing is what is our desire. Do we really want to stop our thinking and to and to perceive ourselves, our real nature? And if we, have, if we have this real desire, we all have this capacity to stop thinking. It's a process and there's a technique. And the best technique that I have ever, uh, because there are many, but the main one, the, the most, let's say, successful technique, it is called Sahaja Yoga. It's very simple because there is a special energy that is called the Kundalini, that is a maternal energy that is inside every one of us. If we somehow open to this energy, and I think we will do an experiment, an experience later on. If you open to this energy, this energy facilitates a lot of this process or stop thinking. It's not that you just stop and then no more. It's not like this. It's just like the, from thoughts to thoughts, there is a, a gap, a space that increase and increase and increase. This space is called in ancient yoga, Bilamba. And this Bilamba starts increasing, increasing. And then you find, oh, I am have no thoughts. And then you are here, you are now, and you enjoy. So let's, I, it's not just thinking, just try. I invite everyone who is with us today just to try with a very simple uh, desire, a pure desire from our heart, and just to experiment because we have inside of us, there are so, so much richness, so much beauty, so much to experiment. And But when we are thinking, thinking, we are here. And we do not experiment that we have a beautiful heart that can love, can enjoy. And there are so many beautiful things inside us that we cannot see them because we are thinking, thinking, thinking. So I, I invite every one of uh, the audience to, to accompany us to this, to experiment later on this, this experience of, of stopping our thoughts. Oh, it's perfect. So later on, after our, our questions, we'll have a chance to experience this meditation. And you're absolutely right. The best way is probably to try and that it's not always so easy. So thank you. <laughs> it's great advice. 
The next mm -hmm. question we have that's come in is, how long would it take me to see improvements with meditation? That's a tough one well, too. <laughs> <laughs> every person is, uh, is unique, it's a world. You can have, uh, mm, from the very first meditation, you can experience that it's something unique with this meditation. And you can experience from, from one day, just overnight, if that, for example, you have problem with your sleep and you still having a good sleep or you, your, your mental or your physical health can improve from one day to the other. This is not the normal case, but in most cases, if you meditate regularly for, let's say a month, a few weeks, in a few weeks, you can see the difference. It is not only uh, because we have, uh, there are many um, bibliography, many literature about Sahaja Yoga in, and on those experiments there were carry on for just a few weeks, four weeks. So if you allow yourself to meditate every day, not much, let's say 10, 15 minutes, with this desire, pure desire to be just in thoughtless and open to your own inner power of Kundalini, you can feel a difference and in, an improvement. So we encourage everyone who's new and joining us to as we go through it, see how you feel. It is an experiment, as Dr. Hernandez has mentioned, and that with continuous practice, you might see amazing results. You might see nothing. It, it's your own experience, right? Mm -hmm. So yes. next. Yes. Number three, mm -hmm. looking back at your research, what did you find most surprising? Uh, most surprising definitely was this uh, big difference with gray matter volume in the whole brain because we, uh, normal, we have when you start your research, you have, you have your hypothesis. You think you 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 look at the literature uh, because there were some uh, other research about uh, this uh, gray matter difference between different populations. Also, there were some related also with meditation, and then you start doing your hypothesis, and then you start doing preparing everything for your experiment you have all the volunteers inside the scanners first the meditator then you have to find a group that is similar in everything and this takes months uh, almost a year and after a year of working and then you press the button and say the computer just run and show me what happens and then i was jumping I, for me it was incredible <laughs> so, so much different i didn't expect this i expected our hypothesis was that there were differences in in the attention, in the control of the emotional areas, maybe a little bit larger because I, I, our hypothesis was this, this this Kundalini, when this Kundalini reaches the, the brain, there's something unique in, in Sahaja Yoga. So we are having, uh, we were optimistic, but the result uh, were much better than the, our best uh, optimistic uh, imagination. Right, and to be able to see that for the first time, I mean, it's gotta be an incredible feeling. Yeah, yes, yeah, was a, a feeling of, of, of joy, of success, and also we just uh, we just did what others did. We didn't do nothing very very specific. The, the, our idea was just to, to 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 try to reproduce what they were doing in other meditation and see the difference. So my my doing was just a, a, a very a, a very simple uh, uh, researcher doing my best, but. No, the unique was not about me, but it was this unique meditation that allows to see these differences. Very cool. That's mm -hmm. excellent. That's really amazing. I mean, to be able to see the impact of something and not just yeah. feel it, but see it on a scientific basis. It's, it's incredible. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And also, I think it's very important to measure because you say, oh, this is the best. And tomorrow, because when you are thinking, you can see this is this, or tomorrow you see differently. But when you measure with a magnetic resonance scanner, this is the thing. And also, an important thing that I didn't mention before is in our group of collaborators, mm -hmm. most of them do not uh, they they do not practice meditation. So for them, it was also a, a big surprise yeah. because I have I am my hypothesis, and they say, well, maybe, maybe not. Let's see, let's see. But when I show them, these are the results, and this is was unique because it was the, the the largest ever published, uh, result, largest uh, difference in gray matter volume. Yeah. Mm -hmm. We have a few other questions that have come in also from the chat. So there's one, mm -hmm. how about ADHD and ADD? So def 
sorry, dementia affecting gray matter and using meditation. So is it possible to use meditation to have the gray matter improve this um, dementia or ADHD, ADD? Yes, there, there are actually there are some uh, research already published with ADHD. And, and with, I remember it was with children and published with, uh, I think the first author's uh, family name is something like Harrison. And they, they, they saw that with, uh, with a meditation, a practice meditation, it was not only the patient who having uh, practicing the meditation, but also on this research, they, they asked the, the family also to cooperate and to meditate all together. So there was an improvement, not only for the patient, but also for the whole family, because sometimes the person who, uh, who is, has a sickness has an influence with the family and the family has an influence on the person. If both, all of them meditate is the best uh, way to, to, to have an improvement. Mm -hmm. So if someone so has... Is, so Sorry. there is a, already a, a, some articles that are published about this saying that there is a, a, an improvement with this uh, sickness. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's pretty amazing. Not just even an own individual impact, but it can have an impact on the entire family as well. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. Another question that come that has come in is how long does it take on average for someone meditating to achieve measurable positive and neuroprotective results? Well, here the problem is not is mainly with the, the instruments. The instrument when we measure gray matter volume, we the, the let's say the state of the art of the the parameter is called the resolution. The resolution is the capacity to see changes, and nowadays the, the capacity to see changes is in the order of millimeters. A millimeters means hundreds of millions of neurons doing new connections. When if you have uh, so normally in this study, for example, there was a study done in Italy, uh, also about gray matter, and they had uh, students practicing meditation for four weeks, and they also see changes, but there was more changes. So the the question here is not um, it's difficult to answer because it's not that there is not a change, but the different the difficulty is that our instrument has not the capacity; they have they don't have an infinite resolution. Because your brain, I think I already said, your brain today is different from your brain tomorrow, but the difference is very, very minimal. It's very difficult to, to, to measure because it's very, very, very small. So it's not a question that the, the brain change, the brain change everywhere. There is this, the main topic of neuroscience that is the neuroplasticity. Our brain change every second. Right. But to measure the, the limitation is not, uh, for on our brain, but the limitation is in the instrument that is measuring these changes. Right. So we'll see in the future as this research continues how the instrumentation it becomes more and more fine and precise. <laughs> yeah, but I think there are some limit. Uh, already, one millimeter is quite a, a high resolution, and and this magnet resonance scanner is a very very complex instrument. I normally on my presentation I show the picture where there is a magnetic resonance scanner and the brain. And I say to my students, look, the brain is the most complex uh, system in the universe. And this magnetic resonance scanner is the most complex and more expensive instrument in our university. Right. So, so the, 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 already the magnetic resonance scanner is quite, quite complex. Uh, and this millimeter resolution is uh, really uh, great. It's, it's amazing that it's able to be captured now. And who knows, yeah, in 10, 15, 20 years, what the what the possibilities will be like? I think they will improve for sure, but I, I don't think they will go much beyond one millimeter, maybe right. okay. a little bit less than a millimeter, but just, well, my impression, I'm not sure. Mm -hmm. So we have another question that's come in through the chat, um, asking for clinical problems like anxiety, insomnia, bipolar disease, Parkinson's disease, amnesia, how does meditation help with these types of illnesses and are they curable? Well, it depends on every case. It's, it's difficult to say in general. And every case, it depends on the sickness. It depends how, how, uh, how, uh, how the sickness, in which state is the sickness. If this is something that is very small or big or difficult situation. Uh, also, uh, so 
the meditation will help for sure, mm -hmm. but it will improve the situation. It will depend on how um, how intense if you meditate regularly or not, how much time you give to for your meditation. But it, for sure, it will improve. It definitely won't but, cause a problem. Yeah, yeah. But there are difficult some some cases that are, are very um, let's say uh, difficult uh, situation when you have a problem with like bipolarity. Uh, that, uh, for example, in gray matter is. Uh, um the situation is a little bit complex so you you have to be a little bit patient and constant and you will get an improvement mm -hmm. but i cannot give a, a unique answer for all cases and all situations it depends so, on the t the strength of the condition yeah. and the of course, a lot of different the factors there are many many factors so it's yeah. the only thing i can say if you meditate regularly and you reach this state of mental silence, your situation will improve. How much it will improve, I cannot say. Right. That would be really cool to see if we could have our own measures of how our gray matter improves with meditation <laughs> as an individual <laughs> over time. <laughs> uh, another question we have for you is, you mentioned so much about these previous research studies that you've conducted. What are you currently working on? Mm, well, we also now we have um, let's say three types of research that are we are currently working on then one of them is related with the uh, the white matter because I, I already mentioned that there are three types of, uh, of tissues in our brain the gray matter and the white matter that is the connection between the different parts of the brain we are working and um, comparing the anatomy of the, the white matter anatomy between meditators and non-meditators. We have a, a specific cooperation with the University of uh, La Habana in Cuba. We are working also, on, we continue with uh, functional connectivity mm -hmm. and also watching all different uh, networks of rewards. Another very interesting uh, research is related with the uh, uh, neuronal activity when we are do, saying prayers like uh, Lord's uh, Father and we compare this with Christians and also with uh, mantras. Um, this, for this, we have a, um, a collaboration with uh, the Aros the uh, University in Denmark. And, um, and also we are starting, uh, um, we have another study in which we are trying to see the neuronal activity correlated when you have your attention in different point of your, uh, of your subtle body. Mm -hmm. that they call chakras and these are the main topics that we are working on today nowadays mm -hmm. well we wish you all of the success with these research studies same, same <laughs> it's really fascinating mm -hmm. i think we have time for one more question um mm -hmm. and the question is what research projects would you like to conduct in the future well uh, in the future, in my mind, it's always a uh, type of uh, related also with gray matter. There are two types of research related with gray matter. The one that we did is called cross-sectional, in which you compare two different populations. One in which you compare, in, the, in our case, was meditators related with non-meditators. That is cross-sectional. Cross they already have been doing practicing meditation for uh, around, in our case, more than five years. And I want to do, and uh, we are planning and organizing to do a longitudinal one in which we take uh, the population without previous uh, experience doing meditation, and they practice meditation for several weeks. We are with, um, we are thinking about eight weeks practicing meditation daily, mm -hmm. and and then we ask them to stop, and then let them meditate this one or not do. So, and we want to measure the difference, no. In, in one of the uh, research that we're all, we talked in the, in, at the beginning, there were students learning to, to juggle. And they measured that those areas related with attention in the, uh, with the vision and, and to concentrate with attention what, what part of where is the movement, they got larger gray matter volume. And we want to see somehow with meditation. This type of research has been done with other types of meditation. But also in Sahayewa, there was a, a, some this type of research related like the, with this one, 
but I want to do it in a different way with eight weeks and then stop for and, and after eight weeks and do it to we ask them to go inside the scanner you have they have to go three times every volunteer inside the scanner this is the main result that they want they have a big desire to do it well that would be amazing especially to see if you're consistent with your practice and then stop <laughs> what is the impact and as you start again i would be yeah. really interested in knowing <laughs> that in the future <laughs> You will come as a volunteer. Well, yeah. you will not come because there are volunteers who don't have experience in meditation. We need people who who didn't have any previous experience in meditation. And then another important topic, because you just mentioned this, all this research is, I am I'm very thankful to all the volunteers because without volunteers, it's impossible to do yeah. this type of research. So all volunteers that have been cooperating with us, uh, specifically in, uh, here uh, we, where we live in Tenerife, and also a meditator who visit us uh, and participate and they go inside the scanner, they meditate inside the scanner. I am very, very thankful to all of them because because of their help, we can show uh, uh, and publish uh, this research. Right. It's so true. Without all of you in each different role, it, this mm -hmm. research wouldn't have been possible. So yes, of course. We mm -hmm. really, really appreciate everything that you've done and you shared with us today. That's all the time we have for questions for right now. So if anyone who's watching has additional questions, please feel free to email us at contactus at sajyoga.org. And Dr. Hernandez will be more than happy to answer any questions or respond to any comments that you have. So thank you again, Doctor, for being with us. Yes. We wish you thank all Thank you very much, Julia. And, and of course, I will uh, do my best to answer all questions. So thank you uh, again um, uh, for having me with you today. My pleasure. And I will continue with you as a normal spectator. That sounds perfect. <laughs> Have a wonderful Bye. rest of your day. Thanks. <laughs> Bye. Bye. <laughs> well, we hope you enjoyed this. I certainly did. What a pleasure to, to share our our chance to be with Dr. Hernandez and to have some of these questions answered. I'm sure we could have kept going on for much more, but right now we'll switch over to the next segment of our program. And this is really to experience that state of silence, that state of meditation that Dr. Hernandez has been speaking about. How do we achieve mental silence? Now, it's something that, as Dr. Hernandez mentioned, it is completely effortless and all it takes is your desire. So the main thing that before we start anything um, is that you don't have to worry or think about, am I doing this right? Is there a certain way to do this? My name's Julia and I'll guide you through all of this. So I just invite you to relax, to enjoy and to see. It's an experiment of our own. What do I feel when I meditate? Do I feel better? Do I feel calmer? Do I feel this energy rising in me? Um, so again, it's something where it's our each own unique experience, and we look forward to sharing it with you today. So before we start the meditation, I'll just do a brief background about what is Saj Yoga. So as we know, meditation, it's a pretty popular phrase nowadays. What is the actual state of meditation? As Dr. Hernandez mentioned, it's when we don't have to worry about everything that's going on, all of our plans, all of the things we have to do in the future. Maybe we're worrying about something that happened in the past and we can't control it. And the brain is so fast, it always thinks back and forth about what do I have to do? What did I do? Should I correct something? What do I have to do next? And it's never a chance to just rest and be silent and to be satisfied and peaceful inside. So what we're going to share with you today is a bit more about Saj Yoga Meditation, where in 1970, the founder of Saj Yoga Meditation, Srimataji Nirmala Devi, created a technique which allows us to spontaneously awaken the subtle energy within us and bring our awareness beyond our thoughts, beyond our emotions, beyond our mental projections and conditionings into this state of silence, where we're aware of everything that's going on, but we're not being controlled by our brain. So you can think of it as thoughtless, not thinking, but I'm aware, awareness, aware of everything that's going on. And this is something that, you know, it's been around for millennia, 
but so few people have actually been able to, to experience. What Sri Mataji was able to do was not only figure out how to spontaneously rise this energy within anyone who's interested, but she's explained quite a lot about the subtle system that resides within us. And when this energy rises and pierces the seventh energy center at the top of our head, it automatically, spontaneously, sahaja, brings us into this state of meditation. So in this slide in front of you, you'll be able to see, see a picture, picture of the system. system. And, and here, here, we can, we can see, see Kundalini, Kundalini energy. energy. Sorry, Sorry one, one, I think, I think there might be a bit of a, of a delay. delay. <laughs> So, so in, in the basis of, of our kundalini, kundalini, thank you, thank for, you for bearing, bearing with us as we, as we figure, figure out why there are technical difficulties. So, so in, in the process of, of our, our cycling cycling cycling, there, there is an energy, energy that rises, rises called the Kundalini. Kundalini. And as, and as it, it rises, goes, it goes through, through the central channel. Channel. And, and thank, thank you for your patience as we see technical Thanks. Okay, 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 thank you for your patience. Okay, thank you. Sorry about that. I think my <laughs> fear of messing up has happened. So now we'll just continue. Um, so again, thank you for bearing with us. So as I was mentioning, there's the subtle system within us that Shimataji has spent her whole life explaining to us. And as the Kundalini rises up through the center channel, it pierces and awakens the various energy centers within us. And that's what actually brings us into this higher state of awareness, into this state of mental silence. So again, we're not thinking about the future. We're not worried about the past. We're just enjoying this moment here now in the present. So what I'd like to invite now is for all of you to relax and join me in a guided meditation where we'll see if we can experience this Kundalini, Kundalini awakening and to achieve the state of meditation together. So before we begin, again, just be comfortable. You can have your hands on your lap, open, relaxed. If you have any glasses or hat or anything that's tight, please feel free to remove them. We want you to have no restrictions at all and to be comfortable. Your feet can be on the floor or you can be sitting in a chair or on the ground. Again, whatever your preference is. So before we begin, I'm just going to show you the various steps that we'll take so that as we actually begin the meditation, you'll be able to have your eyes closed and allow our attention, instead of being worried about everything that's going on around us, to be focused on us inside. So we'll keep our left hand open on the palm of our lap as if we're receiving this energy and desire for this energy to rise, and we'll use our right hand, which is our hand of action, and place it on various energy centers within us. So we'll start by placing it 
on the left heart. And then we'll move to where the hip meets the leg, which is the second energy center. We'll come up to our stomach on the left-hand side of our belly button. We'll return our hand back onto our heart. And then we'll take our hand to the corner of our neck and we can turn our head slightly just so there's no pressure. We'll bring our hand up to our forehead and then bring our hand to the back of our forehead, slightly looking up. And finally, we'll stretch our hand so that there's a bit of pressure in the fingertips and place the palm on the top of our head on the fontanelle bone, which is the seventh energy center. And we'll massage this in a clockwise pattern of seven times. So don't worry about all of these steps. I'll guide you each step of the way, but this way you know what to expect as we go through this meditation. So I invite you all now to close your eyes and to allow yourself the opportunity to feel the silence of your spirit. So let's begin by taking a few slow, deep breaths at our own pace, slowly breathing in, holding our breath for a moment, and then slowly exhaling, breathing out. We'll do this a few times, allowing any tension from the day to let go, to dissolve. Allowing our brain, our thoughts to reduce. We can relax our shoulders Relax our stomach. And we'll open ourselves to feeling the state of mental silence. So here you don't have to do anything you don't need to focus on not thinking. Our goal is to be completely at peace in this present moment. So let's take our right hand now and place it on our left heart. And as we watch our breath, Let's watch our thoughts begin to slow down. We use our hands on these various energy centers to help direct this energy so that it can rise within us. So here silently to ourselves, we'll just say an affirmation to help our desire to grow, to feel this state. We can ask silently in ourselves, who am I? Who am I truly? beyond our family, beyond our occupation, beyond our country. I want to know my true self, my spirit. So again, we'll say silently to ourselves, who am I? Am I the pure spirit?
And when we ask this question, we just listen. We just wait and see what we feel. Now we'll bring our hand down to where the hip meets the stomach on the left-hand side. And at the second energy center, we express the desire for this kundalini energy to rise within us. This can't be forced on anyone. It can only manifest if we have a strong desire. So here silently again, inside, we'll ask ourselves and say, I want to know the truth about myself. I want to know the pure knowledge of the Kundalini. Again, slowing down the breath. Please help me know the pure knowledge of myself. It is when we express this desire that the kundalini automatically begins to rise. So to help nourish this energy flowing within us, We'll raise our hand up to the stomach on the left-hand side. Then we can press firmly underneath the ribcage, comfortably. And this is the energy center of our peace and satisfaction. So here we give ourselves permission to feel completely at peace inside. To let go of any stress, worry, fear, keeping us from feeling completely satisfied and settled. We can say Mother Kundalini Please show me the true peace of my spirit. When we feel that peace flowing in ourselves, we can no longer be controlled by what others think or what we feel like we have to do. We know without a doubt what is the truth for ourselves and we can become our own master, our own teacher. So with this sense of well-being, we can affirm that I am my own master. I am my own teacher. Now let's bring our hand back to the left hand side of our heart. 
bringing our attention inside. Again, we're aware of everything around us, but we're giving ourselves permission to bring our awareness into our own being, to take time for ourself to feel this state of silence. So here we say, I am the pure spirit. I am my true self. It's no longer a question. By knowing who we are, we can feel that sense of security in our heart. We don't have to worry because we are in this present moment. So now let's bring our hand to the left hand side of our neck. And we can press firmly, but again, comfortably. And there's a lot of tension that builds up in this fifth energy center, because this is where we store most of our guilt. So rather than feeling bad about how something went, like for me, maybe the echo of our tech today, we actually can let that bad feeling go, that guilt, so that we can learn about how to move forward in a way that's beneficial without feeling bad about anything. So here in this energy center, we can turn our head slightly to the right, just so there's no pressure. And as we hold our hand in the crook of our neck, we can affirm to ourselves silently, I am not guilty at all. I have no reason to be guilty, to feel bad about myself. So I let go of this feeling of guilt. I want to feel my innate dignity. And I let go of all feelings of guilt. So we can shake off our hand a little bit if it's at all hot, just to relax. And when we let go of our guilt or bad feelings about ourselves, this energy is able to cross through this energy center at the throat and come to the sixth energy center right at our brain. So let's put our right hand on our forehead and we can bend our head down slightly into our hand just so there's no pressure on the neck. And here we give ourselves permission to allow any thoughts that may be disturbing us to go away. Just like watching the sky and we see a cloud pass by, if we have any thoughts at all, we just watch them. And we give ourselves permission not to engage in that thought. So here we affirm to ourselves I want to feel 
the silence of my meditation. I let go of all thoughts. And to further open this energy center as our thoughts begin to reside, we can further increase the space between our thoughts by forgiving ourselves if we've done anything wrong, forgiving others if they've committed any actions against us. We don't need to think about anything in particular, but by saying, I forgive myself and I forgive everyone, this kundalini energy will pierce the sixth energy center and bring us into that state of mental silence. I forgive myself and I forgive everyone. So now again, we'll shake off our hand a little bit and place it on the back of our head with our head tilting up a little bit so it's resting in our hand. And here we ask to this energy that's with inside of us, just as we forgave ourselves, we ask this wise, innate energy to please forgive us if we've made any mistakes, knowingly or unknowingly. Again, slowing down the breath as we watch this energy rise within. watching our awareness rise as well. So now let's take our hand with our fingers pushed back a little bit and our palm placed on the top of our head, the fontanel bone. And with a bit of pressure, we can massage the top of our head, the seventh energy center in a clockwise direction. So starting from the left, going towards our forehead, moving to the right, and then circling back towards the back of our head, completing the circle. Here is the place where we ask for this energy to connect us to the energy that flows all around us. So seven times we say, Mother Kundalini, please give us our self-realization. Please help us experience the true state of meditation. Please give me my self-realization. So keeping our eyes closed, we'll raise our hand a few inches above the top of our head. And here we'll see if we can keep our attention beyond our emotions beyond our thoughts, in this state of silence. 
So as we bring our hand back down onto our lap with our palm facing up, we'll keep our attention at that spot above the top of our head. And for a few moments, let's sit in the silence, the silence of our spirit. So we can see if you're able to maintain that state of silence with that feeling of well-being flowing all around us. So again, keeping our eyes closed. Let's just see, how am I feeling right now? As Dr. Hernandez mentioned, that when this 
kundalini energy begins to flow, we have the capacity to be able to feel it on our nervous system. So it is a tangible feeling, maybe a coolness as an energy flowing in our hands or above the top of our head. Or when this energy rises and feels a constriction in one of the energy centers, then as it helps to heal and nourish the center, we may feel a bit of heat or some tingling. So bringing our hands in front of our heart, keeping our attention at the top of our head, beyond our thoughts. Let's just see, how am I feeling? Do I feel this energy flowing in me? Do I feel calm? Do I feel more peaceful? Have my thoughts reduced? So bringing our hands back down onto our lap, we can open our eyes and we can see if we can maintain this state where we're watching, even with our eyes open. Sometimes as you go for a walk or a run, or you're in nature, maybe playing music, you experience this state of meditation. And it is through this meditation, Sahaja Yoga, that we can experience this state whenever we want, instantly. Sometimes it's hard. Sometimes we're distracted or there's things going on that we have a hard time pushing out of our mind. But when this energy rises and flows, she's able to do it without any hesitation or barrier. So let's see if we can feel this energy flowing above the top of our head. Again, it's an experiment. You may feel a cool sensation above the seventh energy center. You may feel a warmth or a tingling. We're just observing, seeing what we feel. We can try with our left hand. Sometimes we're more sensitive with one hand compared to another. We can close our eyes if we find it easier to check with our eyes closed. And we can bring our hand back onto our lap. So that concludes our guided meditation for today. We really hope that you were able to feel that state of silence and peace within. It's just a beginning introduction and there's certainly a lot more that we can share with you on this journey of peace and meditation. So if you're interested, we offer many classes around the world and Saj Yoga is always available um, free of charge. So if you're in the United States, you can visit us our meetup at Saj Yoga USA. If you're in Europe, you can go to wemeditate.com. If you are in Spain, maybe you'll be able to meet Dr. Hernandez. But until then, you can go to sajyoga.es for online courses. And we offer meditation classes in the workplace. So if you're interested in setting up online guided meditation at this time, um, you can reach out to us at contact us at sahajyoga.org. And we offer these classes in Google, in Johnson & Johnson, in the National Institute of Health, many different businesses. So 
we'll be able to set up anything that works with your schedule. And of course, all of these links are available in the description, so you don't have to memorize them right away. So thank you again for joining us. We really hope that you had a great time with us and found that this research was insightful and interesting. Again, if you have any comments or questions that you want to share with Dr. Hernandez, please reach out and email at contactus at sajyoga.org. And if you have any questions at all or want to, to ask any questions about the meditation, again, we're always available. So it was a pleasure to spend this time with you. And we really hope that we get to see you in one of these classes soon. Have a wonderful rest of your day. Mm-hmm.